Hi, everyone. This is Sandy Smart, and I am a rangeland ecologist and currently serve as the Ag and Natural Resource Program Leader for SDSU Extension. Today, I'd like to talk to you uh, about current and future forage production estimates and why spring pre precipitation is so important. From um, published studies that we see in the literature, um, we can uh, take a look at uh, the vast majority of the states, especially in, in the Great Plains, and um, especially the Northern Great Plains, we see that um, the months of April, May, and June are really important in terms of predicting, predicting annual forage production. If we take a closer look at um, some of the climate diagrams, uh, I've got two um, from North Dakota and two from South Dakota. Uh, and basically these climate diagrams um, show the, the um, curves for precipitation temperature. And then I've added the growth curve of the predominant um, cool season grasses that are for that particular ecological site that we would find. So you can see that um, these growth curves basically match um, the, the precipitation. And when we have uh, warming temperatures um, in the spring, um, we see that that's perfect for uh, growing grass um, with uh, increasing uh, spring uh, precipitation. If we take a little bit closer look at uh, the growth curves and how it accumulates over time, we see that cool season grasses reach their peak in late July and warm season grasses uh, reach their peak in mid-August. The different grasses are shown by um, the different gray lines and the dark line is basically a modeled um, ecological site description for our cool season grasses or warm season grasses. Now, the interesting fact is that <clears throat> spring drought happens more than we'd probably like to admit. And in fact, it occurs anywhere between 25 to 30% of the time. I've got a list of the states and different locations with uh, the, the long-term data sets that are associated with those locations. And if you use um, so, to your definition of drought would be less than 75% of the of the mean precipitation for that period, we actually find that um, in a lot of these locations, um, it's in, in between 20, 25 and 30 percent with a with a few exceptions. So we so drought is actually something that occurs quite uh, prominent in the in the northern Great Plains. So how does uh, spring pre precipitation versus uh, drought versus no drought affect the annual forage production? So this is a data set from the Cottonwood uh, Research Station in South Dakota, where we have uh, from data from 1945 to 1960. And so I separated the years where we had uh, spring drought and non-spring drought. And you can see that the stocking rate, um, light, moderate, heavy, um, stocking affected um, the amount of forage production differentially. So lightly stocked pastures have uh, more mid grasses um, in terms of their uh, plant composition, where heavily stocked pastures are tend to have more short grasses. But what's interesting to see here is that um, when there is a drought, especially for light grazing, um, that affects it. Um, we only we still have 79, almost 80 percent of the annual forage um, at, uh, from from non-drought that would be produced. And so, as you increase the stocking rate, it, it affects it um, more drastically. So, uh, when we get a, a drought on the heavily grazed pastures, it it makes it worse. We only have 65 percent of the non-spring drought forage production when we have heavily grazed pastures. So plant community makes a big difference when we look at its response to drought. We can also look at some of this historic data from the satellite. So we've got um, satellite data going back to 1984, which is from the Landsat satellite. So what we have here in this figure is, uh, again, data coming from the Cottonwood uh, Station in South Dakota. And the curves represent the different quantiles that, of a uh, growth curves. And then that blue line is the average for all of the, of the years. 
So what I have highlighted here are three three different years. 2002 was a drought, 2009 was a normal year, and 2019 was exceptionally wet. And you can see this is the, the normalized difference, um, difference um, vegetation index is basically a greenness index. And you can see that in 2002, the trajectory of that greenness index was quite flat compared to the other uh, years. So it's a steeper curve in 2009 and steeper yet in 2019. So that just gives you an idea of what's happening to uh, the vegetation. So you can tell what trajectory we're on with those different years. Well, how does the greenness index compare to actual um, you know, biomass weight? And so here we've taken some data in 2020 um, at the Cottonwood Station and also a site near Brookings. And you can see that the, the, it works quite well to predict actual forage production. So <clears throat> that greenness index is really useful to compare with the actual forage production. Now taking one step further, we can actually look at um, data that was uh, collected uh, in 2020 and 21. And here what I did was I clipped samples every two weeks in a pasture to, um, to get that growth curve. And so you can see in 2020, um, we had nearly uh, 6,000 kilograms per hectare of uh, forage production, and that's roughly equivalent to pounds per acre. And in 2021, we had half that production. So looking at the precipitation, you can see what I've done is I've highlighted in green color um, the amount of precipitation that it would be above the, the normal, the 30-year normal. And then in the orange colors are precipitation of, um, for that month where it actually falls well below the normal. So you can see that uh, in 2019, we were quite wet. And so that helped to offset some of the dry, uh, dryness that we had in 2020, which still led to a very productive year in forage production. But you can see in 2021, um, <clears throat> we were dry every single month except towards the end, and that definitely affected the forage production. So we actually cut our forage production in half that year. We've also modeled um, the effect of uh, spring, sp spring precipitation that the June through, or April through June, and also previous year spring precipitation that's represented by PS. And then the day of the year, which is actually the last uh, spring freeze. And so if you get a late spring freeze, um, you know, that kind of kills the top growth and the plants have to start over. So in the midgrass dominated plant community, we can see that we had the spring, the current spring, previous year spring, and then the last day of the year to having that spring freeze was important predictors in forage production. In the mi mixed grass prairie that would have some warm season, some cool season, we found that the spring precipitation was important and that last spring freeze. And then in the short grass, which is predominantly warm season, we found that that current spring precipitation was really important. And one last study just to look at uh, was a six year study that uh, was down, done near Highmore. And we can see that I, what I've done is I've modeled um, the April precipitation with the forage biomass that occurred for that um, particular year. And you can see that April was a good predictor in forage production um, for the uh, annual forage production for that year. So if we look back and put out all this together, we know that spring precipitation is a good predictor of annual rangeland pasture forage production. Uh, most rangelands pastures in South Dakota reach peak production by the end of July. And spring droughts happen 25 to 30 percent of the time in the northern Great Plains. And we also recognize that drought is more impactful on heavily grazed pastures than lightly or moderately stocked pastures. And it's really important to keep track of April through June precipitation and pay attention to the precipitation outlooks from the National uh, Weather Service. And that's it. So thank you.